So good morning, everyone. My name is Evange Destunis. Uh, I'm one of the elders here at our church and part of the preaching team. Um, as you know, we are currently going through uh, quite a few weeks, if not months now, with, uh, through a series on uh, the book of Genesis. And we're actually going to backtrack a bit and go back to Genesis 4. The title of the message for today is called Renewing the City, Christians and Culture. Renewing the City, Christians and Culture. What is culture? How are we to engage or connect with it? And how are we going to be instrumental in renewing the city that God is calling us to? Um, let's go back to the passage just by way of uh, background. We're going to be looking at the, the story of Cain and his descendants. Remember Cain had, uh, was one of the two sons initially, Cain and Abel of uh, Adam and Eve. He had killed his little brother Abel. And then he was banished from God's presence. And we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 17. It goes like this. Cain made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. Four generations later, one of Cain's descendants was Lamech. And it says in verse 19, Lamech married two women, one named Ada and the other Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal, and he was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all who play string instruments and pipes, or the harp and the flute, as some versions have it. Zillah also had a son, Tubalcain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Now we see from this, this fall in line, it wasn't the line of Seth through which came Noah and Abraham the nation of Israel, and ultimately Jesus, but it was through the fallen line of Cain that two interesting things happened. Number one, the first city was built. Cain built a city named it Enoch after his son. And secondly, we see the development of the initial aspects of culture. We see that um, one of the brothers, Jubal, was the father of all who play stringed instruments and pipes, the development of music or the arts. And the other son, Tubalcain, forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron, metallurgy, or the sciences. So through this fallen line of Cain, we have a development of a city, moving from being gardeners to city dwellers, and also the coming out of the arts and the sciences. Now, isn't it interesting that it is in the fallen line lineage of Cain that God actually allowed culture to come to the fore, culture to develop, and cities to form. Now, we know that things can go wrong. We see, we already saw in Genesis chapter 11, how they came together and said, then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. So we can see how things can go awry when it comes to developing and building cities. But we do know also, however, that this is part of God's vision, part of his destiny, that we indeed become city dwellers. Because how does the story end? If we fast track all the way to the end in Revelation 21, what does it say? I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. So God has an intention that we do evolve, do go and move from being gardeners, as Adam and Eve originally were, to becoming city dwellers and forming culture within the city. How do we make ends of what our part is, what role we ought to play in the development of cities and contributing to the cultures that form? Part of the challenge that, um, that we as preachers have when we come forth with sharing a message that God has laid on our hearts is that the message needs to, ought to speak to us first before it speaks to you. We have to, we, we raise the challenge of having, having the faith and the scriptures intersect with our lives. Otherwise, we're just talking in theory and hypotheses rather than actual experience of how this passage, this scripture, this truth 
speaks into our life. And I'd just like to share a story of what my reality is in the past few months and years um, and how this culture message speaks to my reality, my context. Um, as most of you know, my other labor of love, the other hat that I wear is I'm a dentist. My f Monday to Friday, nine to five, is working in a dental clinic. And uh, COVID has hit the whole world globally, uh, but it's, it's hit our industry, our profession, in a very, very powerful way. Reason being, because we work in patients' mouths, there are a lot of procedures and protocols that we now have to follow that we never did in order to maintain safety, both for us, for the patients, and for the staff. So we've had to seal rooms, bring in HEPA filters that filter the air every 10 minutes. We have to wear visors, bonnets, gowns, masks, double masks. It's been a, a very trying period. And initially from June of last year when we reopened, it was a very difficult and trying time. Add to that, uh, my assistant of many years uh, had to go on mat leave. She became pregnant. So last November, uh, I was looking for a dental assistant to replace my assistant who went on mat leave. And as in so many other industries, finding workers has been a very, very difficult challenge. It was not until practically the 11th hour uh, when she was on her last few days that I did manage to find a dental assistant who worked with me. Um, not, not to get into the details, it was uh, a very difficult and trying time because I, I work in a group practice, and, uh, and some of the other partners, very intense, very aggressive, uh, very opinionated, um, and things really were not off on a good footing when this uh, new assistant uh, started working for me, making it even worse. In February of last year, she contracted COVID, and it just blew up. It was all about uh, how reckless and uh, careless is she, and she's going to infect us and our patients, and we're going to have to close our practices, and I could get sick. And all, th all through the while, it was all about them, and not, not one person asked, how is she doing? Because she did develop some uh, serious symptoms as a result of uh, contracting COVID. Thankfully, she did recover, but through all the bullying and the, uh, the aggressive behavior of some of the partners, she eventually left. Her whole family's in Toronto. She moved back to Toronto. So I was stuck again with trying to find an assistant back in February, March of this year. It was, again, impossible to find an assistant. I managed through the other assistants in our clinic and their networks to find another assistant that was working part-time in another group practice. And she thankfully made herself available uh, for four of the five days. I worked Monday to Thursday and one Friday a month. She couldn't work on Tuesdays. So it got since March until now, I've been working every week um, but without an assistant for every Tuesday. And it came to the point where I was dreading Tuesdays. It was a very exhausting work because over and above all the treatment that I had to do with two hands, instead of four, I was responsible for the billing, for the next appointment, for the cleaning up of the room, sterilization. I would come home on Tuesdays spent. And this wasn't just one Tuesday, it was one Tuesday after another, after another, after another. That's my story. That's where I'm at. This is the culture that I live in. And, and the challenge that I face is, how is God calling me to speak into, to contribute to the culture of dentistry, and particularly the culture of my clinic, which is very hostile, very aggressive, and in some ways you might say even dark. Well, before we get into looking at that question and actually seeing what the scriptures have to say to it, let's get some basic building blocks on the floor so that we can see what we mean when we're talking about culture. The definition of culture basically is the, the putting together of the raw materials of the earth to make something that is to be beneficial, that gives meaning and purpose and value and contributes to human flourishing. So we get words like horticulture and agriculture or to cultivate. That's from the root word of, of the word culture. If we fast track to the Age of Enlightenment, which would be the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, culture broadened its spoke, and it was not only the gathering together of raw materials on earth, but even the putting together of different notes to form music. 
or to put together different words and form literature and stories and drama. So then it had broadened to speak of culture being the, the spheres and the arenas with which we work in, whether they be finances and business, the arts, the sciences, politics, economics, entertainment, uh, publishing, media, social media. I mean, there's so many, so many areas. Culture is formed, and then when we come together in a city, this is where culture is forged and established. As we look at culture and, and, and working within culture, it seeks to answer the big questions of life. Why am I here? What is my destiny? Why am I living on this planet? If anything, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with humanity? What is wrong with the world? How is it going to be fixed? How can I contribute to that? These are the big questions. And when you piece together the answers to all these questions, you formulate a worldview. And a worldview is something not that you look at, it's something that you look through. It's like a lens through which you look at your existence and your world around you to derive meaning and purpose and value. So how are we as Christians to engage, to connect, to contribute to the culture that we find ourselves in, in a meaningful way that would be reflective of who we are as Christ followers? Well, down through the centuries and spanning the globe, there have been different strategies that the church has employed to connect and engage with the culture. And this is not an exhaustive list. It is, uh, I'm maybe picking up the five more prominent ones. And incidentally, a lot of this uh, material I've gotten from uh, one of my all-time favorite books by Tim Keller, Center Church. I strongly recommend if you want to see a true impactful way that we as Christians are to live in our cities and be imp impactful as the church, it's a phenomenal book. Um, so a lot of that, what I get is, is from that book. So one of the destructum on how to connect and engage with Scripture, we have... Let's avoid it and withdraw from it altogether. Culture in the world is so corrupt, it's, it's uh, defiled by sin, it's competitive, it's uh, greedy, it's political, and sometimes downright cruel. So let's have nothing to do with culture. We are just going to uh, bubble in our church, cocoon ourselves in our church, and we'll just go out there to witness the people, to evangelize, so we can get souls to heaven when they die. That's one approach that the church has employed down through the years. At the other end of the spectrum, though, we have individuals who say, no, we're going to dominate culture. We're going to impose our values onto culture, so through political power. So with social activism, lobby groups, we're going to gain political power, and from the top, we are going to impose the Christian cultural norms onto society. Other individuals take the approach that, you know, the Christian message has a bit of an offensive uh, taint to it. Why don't we just drop the offensiveness of the, of the Christian message and just be relevant to the culture and just meet their needs and their sensibilities and seek to be a blessing to them? I'm not making any commentary. I'm just saying what's out there and different approaches that individuals take. Another approach is to form a subculture, a Christian subculture, a bubble, where we are not going to engage with the culture at all. We're going to withdraw, but we're going to mimic the culture and form our own culture here. So I'm going to have a Christian mechanic. I'm going to send my kids to a Christian school. They're going to have Christian music teachers. I'm going to join a Christian ball hockey league. So I'm only going to interact with Christians. This is going to be my bubble, and I'm going to have Christian bankers, Christian financial planners, Christian... The yada, 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 down the list it goes. So that we mimic culture, but everybody's a Christian in this bubble. And then other Christians basically isolate themselves, but compartmentalize their faith. And what I mean by that is, I'm a Christian on Sunday, but from Monday to Saturday, I, I immerse myself completely into culture. So much so that you can't tell the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. I am consuming culture uncritically, unknowingly, unwittingly, but on Sunday, I'm a Christian on Sundays. 
unwittingly not realizing that by consuming culture in this manner, you get to get your heart shaped by the cultural norms and the cultural values. Is there a way to move forward? Is there a way that the scriptures speak about how we are to connect and engage with the culture? I'm going to highlight some of the prominent points as we go through the storyline of scripture and look at the biblical narrative and see what it says about making, building a city and engaging in the culture that is forming around us. The first thing we get right off from the top is in Genesis 1.1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created the heavens and he created the earth. And the earth was not just an afterthought. There was a lot of wisdom and thought and beauty and harmony that went into creating the earth. Because if you look at the verses from verse 1 all the way to 31, you see how God in six days of that of that story, how he created the physical earth. Culminating in verse 31, where it says, then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. So the first point that we need to realize is the goodness of earth, the goodness of creation. That we are not individuals that just should focus on our souls, our spiritual aspect, but even our physical aspect needs to be uh, uh, looked at and paid attention to. The overwhelming message, though, that speaks to the goodness of creation is the incarnation of God the Son. The overwhelming affirmation of the goodness of creation is when God became human. In the beginning, it says in John 1, 1, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The fact that God the Son became human, took on physical form, speaks of the goodness of creation, the goodness of the earth. But we know that Jesus did not just come to hang around with us and be chummy chummy with us, he came with a message with a purpose that embodied his life and his teachings. And what was that? What was that overwhelming message of Jesus? In Mark 1, we see that it says, The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God has come near. That's good news. That's the gospel in its essence. The time is now. The kingdom of God is here. Believe, repent and believe the good news. What does he mean by the kingdom of God, though? Because, truth be told, unless you watch uh, The Crown on Netflix, we're not too familiar about kings and kingdoms in, in today's society, right? We, if anything, there are some nations, like the United Kingdom, that has, that has uh, a queen and, and, and monarchy. But f by and large, uh, kings and queens are, speak of a yesteryear, or they are merely figureheads in, in today's society. So what, is he, what does he mean by kingdom? What is he trying to tell us here? The kingdom of God is here. Because we know that in his Sermon on the Mount message, he says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things, things that we fuss about and pursue, shall be added, added unto you. So what does he mean by seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness? What is the kingdom of God? Well, very quickly, if we backtrack to the origins of creation, we know that the creator God was the supreme head of the created world. And he had created human beings to be his image bearers. And as his image bearers, they were to rule, to reign over the created order. They were to have dominion over the world. They were to be sub-regents under God. By them choosing to go their own way, they rejected the kingly, orderly, harmonious rule of Creator God and chose to decide for themselves what is right and wrong and what is good and evil, which led to this mess that we find ourselves in today. This is just an extrapolation of wrong decisions and choices that humanity has made down through the course of human history. So, 
by Jesus becoming human, by becoming physical, and announcing this message by word and deed, by his teachings, and supremely by his death and resurrection, he is reinstalled as the Lord and King of the created world and of all the universe. Heaven and earth, he says, has, is in, subject in a, subjection under my authority. And now he calls us to be implementers of bringing in, of ushering in this kingdom of God reality into our present day context. If we look at the Sermon on the Mount, what N.T. Wright calls the kingdom manifesto. I like that, the kingdom manifesto. It describes what the kingdom is like. Who are the inheritors of the kingdom? And who are the implementers of the kingdom? None other than the meek, the mournful, the merciful, the ones that are willing to suffer and be persecuted for his sake. These are the ones that show that the kingdom of God is here and is coming in all its fullness. What are the kingdom values of this upside down kingdom that we find ourselves in? I like how Tim Mackey uh, describes it in the, uh, in the um, Bible project where he says, the kingdom values are the upside down values compared to the values of the earth, where it says, if you want to gain your life, you have to lose it. If you want to gain honor, you gain it by serving. Instead of revenge, you offer forgiveness. To gain true wealth, you give freely your earthly wealth to the poor and the needy. These are the values of the kingdom that God is calling us to, to implement into this reality that we find ourselves in. So, so we, we get it. We have received this reality, this truth. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. He is King of heaven and earth now. And he invites us to implement this gospel message, this good news, by our lives and by our words into the world that we find ourselves in. But as we seek to enter into the world to contribute to culture, to connect to culture, to engage with the culture that we find ourselves in, something happens that is very humbling and very sobering for us. And what is that? As we exit our church walls and go into the community, into the culture, we find that God is already there. He's already there and he's already working. Look at how James puts it in uh, 117. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Then Jesus himself say in Matthew 5, 45 in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord causes the sun to shine on the good and the evil. He sends his rain to the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous. What does that say? That if we go into the world, we find that Human beings, though even fallen, even though they're non-Christians, there is some evidence of their image-bearing of the Creator God. We see evidence of God's truth and justice and beauty and harmony in things that even non-Christians develop. So what does that say to us? What, how does that speak to us? I think in two ways it ought to humble us to realize that God can work outside of ourselves, and he does work outside of the church. He is at work in the church. So that ought to humble us to realize that we can't approach the culture in this triumphalistic attitude that we got it, that we know what's best, and we're just going to come into the world, mop up the mess, take over, and show how things ought to be done. Because the reality is that even as new creations we still have vestiges of our fallenness still in us, in our flesh. And regardless of how beautiful our, our, our cultural developments can be, there will always be a taint of brokenness, a taint of sinfulness. And we need to be aware of that. The second reality, the second reality is, is that though individuals outside of the church are fallen, nevertheless, their contributions are never totally sinful, totally depraved and decrepit. But there are vestiges of beauty and truth and justice and harmony in what they contribute as well. So how ought that to challenge us? 
we should celebrate the goodness of culture and embrace it and come alongside it and be, think critically and creatively as to how we can come alongside and contribute to the goodness that culture has. But what about Jesus? If we look at the, at the life and the teachings of Jesus, what can we glean from what he said? The one thing, the one thing that will turn heads, the one thing that the world will take notice of is suffering love. He said, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. This is what gets noticed. It's been said the people that are willing to suffer, even to give up their lives for something that is true and honorable, they're the ones that get to write the stories of humanity. And if you look down through the centuries, who have been the major storytellers? It has been the ones who have suffered for the principle of goodness to humanity and not seeking what's in it for me. And this is what Jesus is calling us to. As we enter into the world and engage with a culture, he asks that we be willing to not allow it to be about ourselves, about our pockets, about our names, about the power that we can gain from it, but what we can contribute, even if it costs our lives, even if we are forced to suffer for something as, as grand as that. One of the last stories uh, that I want to mention is uh, the uh, parable of the uh, Good Samaritan. And we'll just uh, pick up this story because I find there's some really good things to glean from this. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. I think he got it. Jesus himself said, what is, what are the two most, what's the most important commandment in the scriptures? And basically that's what he said, right? So I think he got it. But listen how it goes on. Love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Stop right there. He asks Jesus, who is my neighbor, wanting to justify himself, it says. Because in his mind, who is his neighbor? His neighbor is the one that is of his own race, the one who is of his own socioeconomic status, the one who is most like him, probably the same profession, other religious law experts. That's my neighbor, and that's what I do. I'm a good neighbor. I love my neighbor because if those are my neighbors, I'm a, I'm a loving neighbor. It's interesting how Jesus responds. He does this all the time, and it's classic. I love this about Jesus. Because rather than telling him, no, this is your neighbor, and that is your neighbor, and that is your neighbor, he breaks out into a story. Stories have a way of driving the point home so much more forcefully, emphatically, than just a prep prepositional phrase. And this is the story that he conveys to this uh, religious law expert. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. A priest. The religious expert would probably say, a priest, that, that would be a good neighbor of mine. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. A Levite. That would make my cut of who's a good neighbor for me to be to. A priest and a Levite. They went on the other side, Jesus said. But a Samaritan as he traveled. And I would preface the word Samaritan with, in the religious law expert's mind, crummy. A crummy Samaritan. Because we know how at, 
at enmity, they were, they were the impure race. They were the lowlifes. They were the ones to be disregarded. He says, a crummy Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, two silver coins, and gave them to the innkeeper. Two days' wages. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I hope it covers the cost. Is that what he said? No, look what he says. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. So he turns to the religious law expert. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? If I was there, stop right there. If I was there and I was beside the religious law expert, you know what I would have said? That crummy Samaritan. Okay, Jesus, I get your point. That crummy Samaritan was the one that was the good neighbor. That's not how he answers. Look how he answers. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Who was the good neighbor? The one who had mercy on him. Oh, that our identity would be changed from evange, Greek, dentist, fill in the blank, to he's the one who shows mercy on people. He was no longer looked at as a Samaritan. He was looked on as one who showed mercy to the one that was robbed by thieves. And I think that's the point that Jesus is trying to make here. You want to be a good neighbor? Make yourself such a neighbor that your identity, your character is changed by those looking on at you. To one who shows mercy on others. Let's land this. Back to my story. To make matters worse, as you know, this, the past few weeks have been kind of like in an uproar because uh, I remember Premier Legault uh, issued the mandate that all healthcare workers needed to be vaccinated. They needed to produce their vaccine passports. Otherwise, otherwise they would be suspended without pay. So wouldn't you know it that the assistant that I found that worked for me except for Tuesdays was not vaccinated, and for whatever reason, had concerns of her own. She wasn't uh, getting into the political thing. She had legit reasons, but she wasn't going to get vaccinated. And the days were approaching now that I needed to find another assistant. In fact, the, the, other, the other partners in the clinic, and which note, everybody in our group practice was vaccinated. They issued a letter that distributed to every staff, every dentist, every worker in the clinic saying that by this date, everybody needed to be vaccinated, otherwise you can't work in our clinic. So now I'm in, I'm in desperation mode because now it's looking like not only will I not have an assistant for Tuesdays, but for every day, uh, and, I, and I couldn't. In one of my uh, early morning prayer walks, I was with Claire at the time. I remember uh, Charlie's words distinctly that you, you need to ask you need to ask the Lord. Um, so taking that, uh, taking that walk, I said, Lord, I'm asking. Um, I'm not asking for comfort. I'm not asking for making things easier for me. I can't work without an assistant. I need an assistant. I need an assistant to work, and I need it right away. I went home after work that day. I retweaked um, one of the job um, uh, job search uh, sites that I had, uh, tweaked it a bit, basically broadened the net. I didn't increase the pay rate, make a sweeter offer, whatever. Within four days, I had 15 employees apply. I interviewed three, and I finally hired one in the nick of time. It, it, it really got to the point that this stuff was wearing on me uh, at the clinic. I, uh, I remember a few weeks ago, I'm going to give a shout out to, uh, to Kathy Haltrich because uh, it's, it's been a pretty difficult uh, patch of time for me and, uh, I was, and she was aware of it because we were, 
with uh, Basil and a few others where we uh, form a prayer group that we pray regularly with. And I was sharing this concern. And she g gave me a perspective that, that allowed me to rise above my experience. And what she told me was, sometimes the, the enemy lays traps for us. And we need to be discerning to see and identify those traps. And before entering into them, Say, I'm not going into that trap. I'm not falling for that trap. I'm going to distance myself from that trap. And it allowed me to, because I felt like I was sinking in that vortex of traps. It allowed me to take a step back, rise above my context, and see how things were unfolding with the various individuals. And it was actually very, very helpful for me. So thank you, Kathy, for, for sharing that. That was really, 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 really helpful. But the fact that my prayers were answered, kind of, kind of harkens back to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And I was, I was rejoicing that these things, having a dental assistant to assist me, to work with me Monday to Friday was a good thing and God answered my prayer. But I heard something else for the first time from the Lord at that time. And that was this. I am providing uh, you with what you need because you are seeking first my kingdom and my righteousness. And many times we know that verse so well, but it's almost like we focused on, on our needs and all these things that will be added unto us that we skip over the first part, not realizing that it's almost like we're enduring the former to attain the latter. But if that becomes our focus, then the seeking is not first. He says, seek first. Make that be what you're consumed about. And these little things will be added unto you. And what I heard from the Lord at that time was, I am providing this need that you have because I want you to bring the kingdom in that dark place in your clinic. I want you to continue being a dentist in all that hostility and bullying and aggression. I will sustain you, but you need to bring the kingdom, bring your light, which is Jesus in me, in that dark place, because that's how the kingdom comes. And that's how we are called to seek first his kingdom, and all these little things will be added unto us. So I close by the invitation. I close with this invitation. What dark place do you find yourself in? What dark place of the world is God calling you to bring the kingdom? To seek the kingdom first, his righteousness first, to bring his light into that dark place. I invite you to not lose heart, to not retreat, to not back off, but to go to those places that are dark, to those places that are challenging and difficult and burdensome, and allow the Lord to strengthen you, to invigorate you, that the kingdom would come, that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you as your children. These are trying, challenging times that we live in. And there's others that are so much less fortunate than me, than ourselves, around the world. And Lord, we lift them up to you, that you would meet them where they're at, that you would invigorate them, that you would sustain them, that they would sense your presence and your power to overcome, to bring glory to your name, that they would be blessed to shine brightly for you. And Lord, as you call us to these dark places, I pray, Lord, that your kingdom would shine brightly through us in a way that is attractive, in a way that is not all about us, but about the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we love and serve and bring to bear witness for. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit 
that empowers us, that prods us and moves us forward. We ask that you would receive all the glory, that our Lord Jesus would be exalted, and that this corner of the world here on Pierrefonds and St. Charles would be a beacon of light for this, the culture that we find ourselves here in the West Island, Montreal, and beyond. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.